Thanks for coming today and giving up part of your Saturday morning. Um, my name is Shantini. I'm the interim program coordinator at what was formerly known as Wind River Ranch, and it's now called the Rio Mora National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and I had a couple of questions from you guys before, so let me just dive into why is it Denver Zoo and all that jazz. Um, I work for the Denver Zoo, but I'm based up the street, 30 miles north of here, um, in Watros. So uh, what happened was um, the land was donated to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but the programs are managed by the Denver Zoo. So our mission has stayed the same, even with this transition. Um, so Clan Eugene Thoy, who owned the land, um, they were actually from upstate New York. They were art collectors, and they came to New Mexico, saw a part of land that they um, you know, had never really noticed before, never seen, um, and they, they bought a place um, down where I guess west of Loma Parda, if you know the area, and then a couple of other parcels opened up and they eventually kind of cobbled together a parcel of land. Um, and unfortunately, because they were from New York, when the land across the street came up, they saw it was flat and they're like, yeah, you know, because they were used to trees. <laughs> and they gave it up. So the, the refuge could have been twice as big, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but what they, you know, they ran it as a Arabian horse ranch for a while. And then eventually they were like, you know, we really want to put this land aside. Um, and that's when Brian Miller, who's my colleague, or rather I should say my mentor, um, came to play. So he came in in about 2005. So Brian's a conservation biologist, and he w was brought in to set up research and restoration programs now, because it's one thing to set the land aside. It's quite another to restore it, to make sure it's healthy to you know to really make sure that this is the land that you, that should be where it, what it should be um, and that's where brian came in and so he started a lot of the programs that we continue today and it's really about an ethic of curiosity so we want to learn about the land we want to learn what it has to offer um, and i'm not don't just mean economically but just you know what is that land for what is that prairie system for um, he also started programs about restoring the land health and about telling our community about it. And so even today, those are our three main focus areas, is research restoration and education. I'm in Mora County in Wathros, um, and it's a little over 4,200 acres. We do have a resident bison herd. Um, so right now we're in the low 60s. We had about 13 calves this year. Um, and we, we have about 3,000 acres of about, um, a, a grasslands, and then the rest are the canyons, and you get the PJs and the, um, even some Ponderosa as well. Uh -huh. There we go. <laughs> so the North American grasslands used to be a vast system that extended from Canada all the way down to Mexico. And it was a mix of grasses. So we had the tall grass, we had the short grass, as well as the mixed grass. Here in New Mexico, it's almost always been short grass. Obviously, for climatic reasons, you, you know, we tend, the last two weeks aside, uh, we generally don't get enough rain for, for anything more than a short grass prairie. Um, however, the grassland system, because it's so fertile and because it's so, um, easily converted to cropland is also one of our most endangered biomes. And this is not just here in North America, but worldwide, whether you're talking about the Mongolian steppes or the grasslands in, in Kenya, all of these have been pretty much converted uh, for human settlement, for breadbasket use, and you know, changed to wheat and corn and that sort of thing. So we have really changed a lot of this system and the existing systems that occur today are very fragmented and much reduced in size. And as a result of that, all the species affiliated with grasslands have also declined, obviously, right? Your habitat shrinks and so you decline. Um, grasslands are formed by two main events. Uh, one is fire, so grasses are adapted, are fire adapted. So when, a, when fire goes through a system, it, it obviously takes off whatever's on top of the soil, but it doesn't affect the root system and it, it, it pops back up. That's what a fire adapted species are, similar to like a flood adapted species. So like cottonwoods and willows, a flooding event is not gonna affect it. Um, the issues we've had with salt cedar, they're not flood adapted. So if you do have your natural flooding events, salt cedar would not proliferate. It's because we've changed that system that other invasive species have proliferated. Um, and the other thing that grasslands are adapted for are grazing. So they, we used to have these vast herds of bison 
that, and all those clipping and chipping actually um, spurs the grasses to regrow. And we have changed both of these systems radically because our grasses now do not extend from Canada to Mexico. So wildfire, wildfires are obviously rather inconvenient and incredibly expensive and incredibly devastating. And so we've reduced a lot of the fire load that grasslands used to have. And we have also impacted bison quite a bit. Um, not that long ago, we set out on a campaign to kill them all, to decimate them from the face of the earth. And this was a combination of a campaign against Native Americans in general, just to starve them out of their land. Um, the railroad systems that opened up stretches of the West that previously was not made available, as well as advances in technology, mainly firearms. Basically, now we could shoot again and again and again, repeat arrivals without reloading. And all of this contributed to the devastation of bison. It did not take us very long. Um, Historical records say that in the 1800s, we had about 30 million bison, sometimes even upwards of that. And by the late 1800s, they were down to under 1,000 individuals. Um, and we did that very quickly and very easily because bison are not, they don't have a flight response with, with gunshots. So when you down an animal, the rest of the herd walks over and kind of like, hmm, wonder what's going on. They don't run away. And so you can sit there and go boom, 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 boom. And that's how they really decimate it huge herds of bison. Thankfully, that has since is part of our history. Um, so we still have bison today, and uh, they are making a comeback. We have about a half million bison in North America. But most of the bison in North America are managed as meat herds. So bison is very trendy now. It's very popular because they're better for you cholesterol-wise and all that. And so a lot of people have switched to bison. But a fraction of that, about 30,000, have a conservation purpose. So they are run as conservation herds, which is to say that they are left to do their own thing. We were very quick to wipe out bison, but by doing so, we didn't actually study what they were doing to our system. If you can imagine how big the grassland system used to be and the fact that we had 30 million bison running around, they must have had a huge impact on the land. But surprisingly, we know very little about what that impact is because we were so quick to wipe it out, both the land as well as the bison. So now with these herds of bison, similar to the ones that we have at the ranch, we can observe, we can learn, and we can try and understand maybe a little bit of what they, they were doing to the land. Um, so we often talk as bison as keystone species, um, and I wanted to explain that concept a little bit. So keystone species is a species that has a disproportionate effect on its environment, whether that be species diversity or community structure. So for example, an ecosystem engineer that's often used is um, a beaver. You got a beaver, one little fella like this, when it builds a dam across a river, it affects the entire hydrology of that river. And anything upstream from that dam floods the banks, you create a riparian wetland system that affects the vegetation, you get willows sprouting out, that affects the kind of insect community you might have, the bird community, other small mammals or predators or herbivores that might depend on that community. So this little guy pretty much controls everything around it, <laughs> who its neighbors are, you know, who gets to live there, and so it has a, a really significant effect. Um, another kind of keystone species are apex predators. Um, classic case study, uh, wolves obviously in Yellowstone. When wolves um, were extirpated from Yellowstone, we had obviously an a uptick in elk numbers, right? And they were hammering the aspen stands. So the aspen stands were shrinking. Well, when wolves were introduced, they were not introduced for the aspen, but they were introduced for other reasons. They affected the aspen in a very positive way because they obviously brought down the numbers of elk and the aspen stands continued to go up. Now, Correct, they hunted and killed elk for sure, so they depressed the numbers, but they also changed elk behavior. Because when elk had wolves back in their system, they started to be a bit more cautious. So they don't graze in one spot as often, they're moving a lot more, and that released grazing pressure on the aspen. And so there are some um, keystone species that affect an entire system through either competition, depredation, or just influencing your behavior. A uh, third type of keystone species we have are mutualists. Now this is usually when we talk about pollinators or seed dispersers. Um, in white bark pine country, that's a whole system 
that is completely dependent on the clock's nutcracker. You don't have the bird, you're not going to have the habitat. You don't have the habitat, you're not going to have the bird. And so, but that whole system exists because of a bird, essentially. Um, with bison, we usually call them ecosystem engineers. This is why they're keystone species. And their ability to engineer a system is based on their grazing and movement patterns. So with bison, you can imagine if they're moving along a landscape, every hoof print creates a disturbance event, right? It grinds out some grasses, it, it exposes some soil. If a big old male decides it's gonna create a wallow, it might create a bigger disturbance event. Um, every time they eat, that creates a change in the system. And interestingly with bison, what, they're very messy eaters. So if you look at their plate, they have a little bit of gravy here, a little bit of green chili, and a whole bunch of broccoli they haven't touched. It's like that in the grassland system. You have areas where they're kind of hammered, you know, right down to the nubbins. Others where they're kind of moderately grazed. Others where it just seems like they just missed it, just completely bypassed it. But it's, you know, blue grandma all the way. It's not like it's different. Whereas if you look at cattle grazing, it's very uniform. Clip, 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 all the way across. Now this is important because um, it creates a landscape mosaic. And what I mean by that is you have bare soil, bare soil, ungrazed, ungrazed, moderately grazed, moderate grazed, and all those little patches of habitat have their own suite of vegetation and animals that depend on it. So you, if you step back from that system with all these patches, you get an incredible diversity across the landscape. And I didn't have a picture of grasses that did that, but it's a similar idea. You have patches. And those patches are important because of the concept of resiliency. So I'm not going to get too nerdy at it, I promise. But you can describe resiliency in two ways. One is um, resistance to change. So you have a disturbance event, for example, and nothing happens. So if you see the blue line, that's a disturbance event. It's whole steady. And then the second disturbance event was somehow above some threshold, boom, it collapses. Okay, so it was resilient in the first instance, but not in the second. But if you look at the red line, the broken red line, first disturbance event, boom, crash, but it recovered. Second disturbance event wasn't as bad. It recovered fairly quickly. Now, both of those things are resilient. And when you have a mosaic of different habitats, what happens is you're hedging your bets. Somewhere out there, if something were to happen, there's going to be a handful of species that can withstand the change and another handful of species that can recover after that change. And that's what makes a system strong because it's, it never collapses, really, right? Um, and so that's why resiliency is important. And so when you have a natural system, it tends towards incredible complexity. So a system like this has meadows, it has valleys, it has hillsides, it has grass, forb life, wildflowers, yucca, trees, and it supports a vast suite of species diversity. You have your bison, of course, but you also have your prairie dogs, your black-footed ferrets, your American badger, your coyotes, let's see, your pronghorn, um, I'm sure there's a mountain lion, a mule deer, elk in there as well. You have your songbirds, your vultures, your raptors, and all of those things that are different trophic levels, from things that get eaten to things that are eaten sometimes to things that are doing all the eating, right? Now you look at this picture and tell me how the following pictures differ. Human. That's all you know. Exactly. And why is uniform bad? What loose of brain and lumber. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen that. That was really cool fun, huh? It's amazing what you can do with Google these days. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, and it, again, it's, it's uniform, right? It's simple. And so while natural systems trends towards complexity, human systems trends towards simplicity. And the reason for that is we want to manage it, we want to control it, we want to know how much harvest we can get. So we want to control every aspect. And if it's complex, it means it's dynamic. You can't predict sometimes all the different things that could happen. So you simplify a system. But what happens when you simplify a system? Well, what if there's a southern pine beetle <laughs> or a fungus? 
Correct. Or even, a, or even a hurricane. Correct. Yes. Because it's one type of habitat and one suite of communities that is attached to that habitat. And if that habitat is destroyed in any way, everything is gone. There is no backup. There is no AAA to call. There's no 911. It's done, right? <laughs> And so this is why resiliency and, and natural systems and maintaining that natural systems are important. Here in New Mexico, when we talk about grasslands, I'm sure you have heard a lot of issues about pinon and juniper, right? The PJ problem. Now, why is it a problem? I mean, PJ is native, right? So, but why, why do we think it's a problem if it's a native species? Say again? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I will call that an inconvenience. <laughs> now, PJ is a native species, and they are typically found, or they're adapted for rocky, steep slopes. And the adaptations for that harsh environment is actually quite amazing. Uh, one seed juniper have tap roots that go down 160 feet. They have juniper have these. Uh, this fine root system, they're called filaments, that extend outwards, and they're three times the height of the tree. So if you get a six-foot juniper, its root system out horizontally, it's 18 feet. And they do this because they're on a steep slope, really bad soil, very little water, so they need to get all the water they can get. But the problem now we're seeing is that they're walking out to the grasslands, because given the choice, I mean. <laughs> Exactly. Well, give them the choice. Why not, right? You've got a nice, fertile soil. But they have no economic value, so uh, ranchers that I know just tear them out because yeah. they compete with the cows. Correct, because they compete with the grass. Yeah. And the reason mm -hmm. they, because they have this great root system that captures all that water. And now that's a picture of a juniper, and you can often see a halo effect under a juniper. And that's because it sucked up all that water. It's out competing the grass. Mm -hmm. And so when you lose your grass, what else happens? Erosion. Exactly. You know, because there's no root system to hold on to the soil. Even strong winds will blow it away. Or if you have rain, that gets run off. Um, whatever moisture is able to soak in is being used up by the juniper. And so it doesn't get down to the water table. So your water table goes down. And so there's, there's a whole suite of problems that come with PJ, right? And this is what I mean by walking. PJ belong here. They don't belong here. Okay, And they're able to do this for two reasons. They're not fire adapted. PJ is not fire adapted. But we've suppressed fire to such an, effect, such an extent that now it's not, no longer an issue. And overgrazing hasn't helped. We've already de degraded the land. And that makes it easier for PJ to get a stronghold when, when you have a disturbed system, because they are used to really harsh, um, hard environments. And, and juniper is the most drought-resistant plant there is in existence. So you know, it's, they're, they're quite happy out on the grasslands. On a side note, if you squint real hard to this spot, that's where I live. <laughs> <laughs> So this is Orphan Hill. Um, I also call it my cell tower. I get excellent film service right about here. <laughs> um, but yeah, literally all around you can see how PJ um, has really made an impact. So um, I mentioned Brian Miller earlier. So when he introduced bison at Wind River, this is back in 2008, he started noticing some differences with PJ and yucca. And so he's like, you know what? I'm going to conduct a little simple experiment. I'm going to run some transects. And a transect is literally is a predetermined length that you determine, um, as well as the number of transects you're going to run, point A, point B. You're going to walk it, and you're going to count all the PJ. Okay? And he was looking specifically for horning activity. So horning activity, basically, you know, bison have horns, and they kind of scrape up things. You see that in elk, male elk, when their antlers are coming up, they rub against a tree, they tear up the bark. Well, imagine with bison that much bigger, year-round, male and females. Okay? So he started counting and looking at how and what type of the extent of the damage to pinon and juniper with, um, at, at the ranch with bison, at a neighbor's ranch with cattle, and at another neighbor's ranch with neither bison nor cattle, but with the occasional elk. 
and he found that bison really can have a really strong impact. Now, bison can't tear up a mature pinyon juniper. If it's big, it's done. But if you get a pinyon juniper about my height, and you come across it, they, they break it up. So you can see, and they repeatedly break it up, break it up to a point where it just can't take root. So young and new growth can be stemmed by bison. And in the North American system, they play a similar, similar role to elephants in the savanna of Africa. Because usually you have grassland, and then it transitions to savanna or woodland, right? You have interspersed trees to like an actual forest. And that's a natural thing. But right now, we're losing our grasslands because the woodlands have been encroaching. And so bison in the past may have played a more significant role than we realize in keeping that encroachment in check. Um, obviously, this was a small study. Uh, we've been trying to get a grad student to kind of do this for us. <laughs> I don't know why we haven't had any takers. It seems like a perfect excuse to go for a nice long walk. <laughs> so uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get some. Yes? So uh, per hundred. So basically, um, per hundred um, plants. So 91 out of 100 yucca plants encountered on this transect were getting horned up and beaten up. No. Okay, and then to a much lesser extent with cattle, because I mean cattle did, did not, they, cattle are, are introduced species, they did not ad adapt with yucca and pinyon juniper, right? So they, they would, it's understandable they would not have as big a role. Elk, because it's limited to male elk at a certain time of year, would, would also have a much reduced um, effect. The other thing bison do um, is, is affect head cuts. So here in the southwest, we see a lot of head cuts, and we see a lot of arroyos. And we often think, oh, that's just part of the southwest. It's natural landscape. But it's not. There's nothing natural about arroyos. Arroyos tend to be the product of our inadvertent channeling of water. So we often interrupt natural dispersal of water. Okay, so water disperses across the landscape. But when you put a road in the middle, it's inconvenient because now your road has water. So what we do is we raise the middle of the road, right, so it sheets off. But once it sheets off, it cuts a channel on the side of the road, correct? Um, and those events, whether through bridges or railroads or roads, have channelized a lot of water. And all we've done is actually concentrated that flow that was previously dispersed across the landscape into this much. So all that flow and all that force has now done this. So what happens is you'll get a little rivulet, a little head cut, a bigger head cut, and a royo. And with head cuts like this, as essentially this will continue to eat back and you will continue to lose the grasslands that are there until it hits trees and then it'll kind of work its way between the trees and kind of do its thing. With big head cuts like this, bison can't do a whole lot. I'm not, not suggesting they're you know, out there working on our head cuts. However, with little head cuts, like four or five feet high, they also horn these up. So they will actually um, scrape their horns against the bank and they'll actually tear it up a little bit. But what happens are you will actually get these big clumps of soil that drops down into the ground, including the grasses and stuff. And this may not seem like much, but given a bit of time and given a little bit of rain, those clumps of soil actually can take root. And what this, this is the same head cut, by the way, about a month later. Um, and what has happened here, you can see the slope has been reduced. Um, slope, grade, all of that is important for for water movement. The faster the movement, the more the force. So when you have a 90 degree angle of a head cut, it's really corrosive and it can actually gouge out the earth. But if you can make it a little bit less deep, then the water is less likely to take away the soil from it. So in this case, with the grasses growing back, it also stabilizes the soil. So when there is a rain event, you can see there's still going to be a little bit of um, erosion where it's deepest. But once it hits there, it is less likely to lose the soil, you're less likely to lose the soil downstream. Um, and this is something that we've actually 
employed a lot of, uh, we've taken a lesson or two from the bison basically. Um, so sometimes when we have school groups out, um, either to do community service or sometimes they're out for educational purposes, purposes we, um, you know, we tell them about the grassland systems, the bison, the river, and then we give them shovels. <laughs> and we tell them to put their backs to it, and we repeat that, essentially. Um, and it's really not that hard to do, obviously, for bigger head cuts, you can't take a shovel to I mean, you can, it's just going to take a while. Um, but for, you know, you often see just in, on any road you go to, you see, you can see head cuts going, it's head cuts going. It's, it's often, you know, where the water sheets the worst. And this could be a simple solution. It's not an easy one. None of the restoration work we do um, at Wind River is particularly easy. It's often backbreaking, um, in part because we're now federal property, right? So there's 101 permits <laughs> and certifications. So often we end up with hand tools because that's the path of least resistance. <laughs> we, often, we often do that. But, but this and other work we've done, um, including in, we're looking at bison in riparian areas, so bison in your river systems. So that's often a controversial topic with cattle in river systems, right? Because they, they stomp around the bank, then you lose your vegetation, and then slowly it just that soil gets lost downstream, you get more sedimentation, they also tend to um, crap a lot in the, in the rivers, and that can affect the quality of water. Well, bison move more. It's just in their nature, and it might be predatory behavior, just in their genetics. They just move more, because no prey item, even though it's hard to believe that bison would be a prey item, but they can be, the old, the sick, just like any other group of animals, move, naturally they move a lot. If somebody is going to come and eat you, you're just going to move. You don't, you don't pause, you don't, you, don't, <laughs> you don't take a cat nap, you know, you're just on the move. But that means too that their dung is distributed across the landscape. And that's, that's something you can see really, the next time you drive, if you drive up to Rio Mora on 161, if you look on one side of the fence and you look on the other side of the fence, the concentration of dung patties is interesting. <laughs> and we've often had these conversations because we do a lot of research and restoration, right? So unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of nerdy people that, that I work with. And we all go, hmm, that could be an interesting study. We could go and count that, and we could go and count that. So it's actually, next year we are going to count that. <laughs> We're going to run transacts just like we did with the PJ and the Yucca. And we're going to count dung patties. And, and other people have done this before. There's just, cows just tend to clump together a bit more. It's just their natural behavior. And bison don't. They, they move as a herd, but they move. And as a result of that, the fertilizer and everything is, is spread out. The disturbance events that I talked about is spread out. And there's a lot more um, homogeneity, heterogeneity, sorry, as opposed to uniform sort of blockage. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Cows are constantly, they, they walk in a path behind me, too, mm -hmm. the device don't do that. Yes and no. Um, you will have, like, game trails are game trails. Uh -huh. You know, um, there are areas at the ranch where it's really steep and it's really gamble oak left and right, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you put a two track in the uh -huh. middle of that, Heck, they'll use it, your coyotes will use it, your bears will use it, everybody will use it, right? I mean, who wants to go climbing through the Gamble Oak unless you really have to? Um, so they do as well. Um, they're just less predictable in their roots. They're not going to go, so the, the impact on that particular piece of path is just not as heavily trotted as they might. And with our bison, they're free grazing, so they're on their own. We don't supplement hay feed them. In the winter, they're on their own. Because bison, you know that big old mouth that they have? That's adapted for the snow. They will swish the snow aside to get to the forage underneath. Mm -hmm. So that's what they were built for. So the, the winter doesn't, you know, they, if you put cows on a, and you don't feed them and, and it's covered with snow, they will sit on available forage and starve because they don't know that it's there. Mm -hmm. Whereas bison, you know, this is their thing. This is how they, they work. Um, and with, with a lot of, and a lot of it's practices too. So with cattle, you move them to one pasture and you move them to another pasture, you move them to another pasture. Well, when they're in that pasture, it's a pretty small piece of land that's concentrated use. 
and then you move them to another, and then you concentrate the use. And, you know, I mean, if you do the same thing with bison, you'll get the same effects. It's not like bison's your magic bullet. You, you know, if you're going to heavily graze any animal, rabbits can have an incredible effect on, on forest. You know, any, too many of anything is bad, right? Um, we've reduced the impact on the land with bison only because we kind of let them do their thing. The only, way, the only thing we bar them from is the buildings because that would involve a lot more upkeep than we're willing to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because they rub, they rub on things. If there's a post out there, you, it's, you have to come back every couple of months and straighten it out. And, you know, our speed sign is like this way. Um, the bulls were just in a rut this last month to six weeks and then it's like, oh, you know, we're fixing fences and all sorts of things because they're, they're big animals, you know, and they can do their thing. So, um, so yeah, it really just depends. They, they do use pass as well, but the number of bison and whether or not they're delegated to particular areas makes an impact as to whether that path gets degraded or not. Does that make sense? Um, and that's about a wrap that I have for you. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and yeah, if you have any questions, I will do my best to try and answer them. I do. Uh, all this, your lecture dealt with the bison on the, uh, and the impact. How long, uh, what's the time scale here of the first introduction and seeing some of the changes that are occurring? Because uh, you, were, you were saying that there's probably about 75 head we currently have the low 60s right now. Low 60s, mm -hmm. and that impact, I mean, mm -hmm. can you see the immediate uh, so impact, especially on the P and J? Yes and no. In some areas where P J has encroached to, um, where they're quite mature, right. then the impact of the bison in those areas are only on the small ones, mm -hmm. right? Um, there is a part of the ranch that the bison just don't go to. I don't know why. They just don't go to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've heard from, from other ranchers that, that run bison that they say if there's a, a part of the land that they want them to graze to, they, they have to force them there so that they learn that that place is available. But that's a bit more active management that we'd like to get to or that we're set up for. Um, so we don't, we don't corral our bison and chase them to an area and like, hey, that's forage up here. Uh, we kind of assume they'll eventually find it. In, those, in that particular area, we have seen dramatic, dramatic pinion juniper encroachment, which of course then we're going, hmm, another student could do this and that. But for mature PJs, if you're trying to restore that grassland, you have to use mechanical means. You can't depend, you, there's no amount of bison that's gonna take down a mature juniper. Right. So you have to bring in your chainsaws and you have to do that. So uh, how long is that time frame? Um, so they were came in in 2008. Um, we probably started seeing effects between three to five years in varying capacities. So it really just depends on, again, um, how much, because they were moving around it as well in terms of, so certain areas you see a more concentrated effect than others. So how big is that area that they're impacting right now? Because uh, the, uh, you said it was like 4,200 acres mm -hmm. that they're on mm -hmm. right now, so, and some of those areas aren't being... The area where the buildings are, that's the only part that's fenced up. And even though they have access to the north pasture, they're not there for whatever reason. Um, so they probably have access to three quarters of the land. It doesn't mean they use it. It doesn't mean they're, they use it the same way every time. Some areas you can see um, right off 161 from the main gate all the way to the west, the, we call those the uplands, they use that very heavily. For whatever reason, they use the area closer to the main gate a lot more than the west gate. And we can see the impact on the soil and the grasses because the grasses in the west, on the main gate, is always looking a little bit sore. But there's all this forage and they'll go there over the winter. So they'll hit the west gate over the winter. In the spring, before the monsoons, they go down. Between my house and the headquarters area, there's, there's some pastures down there. They hit that area um, because they're about to breed, and so that area is a bit more protected. And so they, I think they feel maybe it's in the canyons, and so they're a little bit more perhaps wary and cautious, so they want to be able to have better sight lines. Um, and then once the monsoon hits, boom, they're back up to the north. So they do move. I've, I've been amazed at how quickly these guys move because they're such a big animal and just such, you know, you think they're kind of slow, right? But 
But yeah, they can move some pretty pretty significant distances. Um, they're cool to watch for sure. Yes. Yeah, you have talked about the, the effect on, uh, on land and mm -hmm. shrubs. What's their effect in interaction with the other animals? Is there other species that proliferate because bison are there, or is there, do they harm other species, or is there, what's the interaction with the bison and the land and species? Um, we leave them be, so we don't control whatever interactions is to be had, we leave them be. So, for example, last year we had a calf that was born lame. It's a wild herd. So, it was with the herd for about maybe four months, and then the mother would keep with it, and then after a while the mother didn't. Um, so I'm sure it fed something. I don't know what it fed. Um, we have elk and mule deer. They don't necessarily interact, interact. Um, we have very few pronghorn in part because of the fences. So we are, you can't take the bottom wire off your fence unless your neighbor does, because otherwise you just get stuck in the road. Um, so we, ha we do have a pronghorn herd, uh, Fort Union, which is on our north neighbor. So we've actually talked to them about pinning up the bottom wire at crossings. Um, and so, you know, if they're okay with that, we're okay with that. Our fences are not the big old high 12 foot typical fences that you get on a refuge. We are elk friendly. Um, fence. It does mean we have to keep our fences right, <laughs> um, but it's not um, because our herd is actually not owned by the feds. Um, they actually uh, we're in the process of trying to get them set up as a cooperative herd for the local pueblos in northern New Mexico, uh, because unfortunately, a lot of the pueblos, about half of the eight pueblos in northern New Mexico, don't have enough land to run their own bison. And even those that do have to spend a considerable amount feeding them because the land that they have doesn't yield enough grass. So if we are able to set this up as a cooperative herd, then what we're hoping is that we can restore some of the cultural rituals and practices and traditions that they have lost or can only practice at very particular, peculiar times when a bison is available and that sort of thing. Yes? Uh, I want to follow up with this question. Yes. Being that they're eco-engineers, and you described how the beaver impact uh -huh. their environment, uh, what what are the like some of the impacts that the that the, that the bison are having on some of the other species? Mainly disturbance events. So um, just their land use, the fact the size of the animal, and their movement alone, because they move such vast distances in such a short time, their impact on their system as they move is quite large. At certain times of the year, the herd actually splits up to two or three herds, and then they're having smaller but significant impacts as opposed to when they meet up for a big herd. And then you have, like, like all animals, like all herd animals, when, when the calves come into play, when you have lactating females, when the bulls go off on their own in, in the winter, they all split up, which is interesting too, because they tend to split up during the winter when everything is stressed, right? The system is stressed while well, they split up as opposed to getting all concentrated. So the disturbance events are even almost timed really well for seasonal differences um, to what the land can hold. And that's obviously a natural system. That's nothing to do with whether we're lumping them together or splitting them apart. We wouldn't try to get in the middle of that sort of dynamic, but they're, that's what they naturally do. They split up over the winter, and so that the grazing pressure on the land is also split up and spread up during a time when there is no growth, really. It's whatever, whatever growth that had happened over the season is dormant in, I mean, the winter is whatever's left. Um, and you can tell, too, what they start to hit um, during certain times of the year. So in the spring, they hit driven grasses. And over the summer, they hit driven grasses. Over the fall, they hit driven grasses. And then even the winter, they hit driven things. And that they're much so, that sort of system, while it may seem like a very small thing, it's actually pretty significant because if you have a cattle ranch and you have Kentucky Blue, then all you got is Kentucky Blue. You don't, you can't depend on different things unless you're hay feeding, right? They're not gonna, it's not gonna self-sustain. Kentucky Blue is not gonna sustain you for 365 days a year. So this is a system that does. And those impacts, every time they graze on different things, impacts other things that depend on that. 
And so if we were to try and replicate what they do to the system, you know, think about it. We'd have to go stomp around, we'd have to go, we'd have to move here, we'd have to pull out some of this grass but not that grass. That's not something we could ever replicate. That sort of complexity and what that means, we could never replicate that. We can sit back and go, oh my gosh, you know, that's really cool. And we can maybe learn a little bit here and there, but we could never choose to replicate that. It's just way too, you know, too complex. Um, bison and paradox are often very closely linked, uh, probably less so than they are now. Um, there was a study that showed that bison preferentially grazed on paradox towns, and they thought it might have to do with, because paradox are considered ecosystem engineers because they aerate the soil, and they also, they're rodents, so there are lots of waste matter all over the place, right in the, um, in the soil itself, and that encourages some growth of different things. Um, and because of, um, they tested, I guess, the nutritional value of some of the, the forage that grew out of it, and there, were, there appeared to be a difference. But again, it's about intensity, and it's about numbers and density, and all of those things. You had a question earlier, yeah. and I'm sorry. It kind of ties in with what you were just saying, mm -hmm. because I've read lately there's been a lot of studies that they're afraid that the natural grass mm -hmm. that grows in this whole area is in danger mm -hmm. because of the continued drought, because of the overgrazing. Mm -hmm. It rains, it looks green, but it's not grass. It's just different plants, weeds. Right. And it's not buffalo grass or native mm -hmm. grass at all. Have you seen that in this study? Is that part of the study? Um, a lot of, it's hard to answer that question because whether weeds proliferate or whether grass proliferates depends on so many things. Yeah. Um, and we, Okay, we have 4,200 acres, right? It doesn't seem, it's, it's really not that big when it comes down to it. And we put up probably nine rain gauges spread out all over the place. And we sometimes get three inches difference from one mm -hmm. side of the ranch. Yeah, you all know this, mm -hmm. like, you know, even if you haven't measured it, yeah, it will rain across the street. Right. <laughs> you know, we're flooding here, we're not. So mm -hmm. that has a role to play. Mm -hmm. The slope and gradient has a role to play. We have at least four different soil types, and soil types matter because their ability to hold water differs according, you know, think of, think of sand versus clay, you know? Mm -hmm. Sand will just run off, right? And part of it is that particles are so big that they don't hold it, whereas clay particles are really small and they're, um, they have a um, magnetic power, basically, so they, they hold on to the water molecules, and so that's why it's always kind of damp. Um, so that comes into play. What kind of grazers you have come into play. Um, any grazer in any high capacity is going to degrade the system, but a lot of these plants are adapted for grazing, so you know, some grazing is always good. Um, concentration and intensity of your herd matters. Um, so you know, a lot of, so it is a hard question to answer. Yeah, I was kind of just thinking, I'm just wondering if any part of the study was done of the grass and the types of grass and where it was before and during. Oh, before and after. Yeah. Brian, see a difference. Yeah, Brian, to his credit, before, the year before he got bison in, he put up seven exposures. So it's, it's not very big. They're probably about the size of that, where the chairs are. And he just set it up. Just, as a, just to see what happened in there versus out here. <laughs> And so we have, we have that that we've seen. And it, it differs. It differs on, uh, depends on water. A lot of it's water dependent. Mm -hmm. Because it's inter that's interesting because it's spread up on all the different soils and all the different areas where the water is different. But we can still compare what's inside the exposure versus what's outside the exposure. And we generally see by height, there's greater height so that the grass is obviously not getting gray. So, but we're keeping out all grazers, not just bison. That's another thing. Because trying to keep up one grazer versus another is not that easy. In fact, my, uh, I've got a colleague who's doing exactly that, and she's trying to figure out how do I build a fence that keeps up bison but not elk or pronghorn? How do I build a fence that keeps up elk but not pronghorn and bison? How, you know? mm -hmm. And she's trying to do that, and then for a while there we had a llama running around, and she's like, I give up. <laughs> 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 what am I going to do with a freaking llama? <laughs> and so, um, but you can see differences. It is a bit anecdotal from what we have right now. She is a veg expert. I am not. So she actually went in and started documenting and documenting. So she hasn't pulled out that in terms of teasing out, because that kind of data is more useful over a long term. Mm -hmm. Because you just do a one-time event, it's not, not as useful. Yes? I know with elephants, a lot of foods they eat 
you know, in their dung there's the receiving. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what they're eating, they're actually receiving again. Is that true with the bison too? They, they yeah. can read um, uh, their dung from create receiving? It can. Um, it also provides habitat, um, dung beetles. Uh -huh. and, and the fact that there's ever, you, in the grassland systems, there's not a lot of cover, right? We don't have a lot of um, natural rocks or shrubs, natu natu um, except, for, you know, as, unless there's pineal juniper encroaching. So the dung actually provides habitat and cover and shade uh -huh. for a lot of herbs. Um, so, um, what do you call that? Gosh, lizards and such. Uh -huh. um, often, often when you go herbing on the grasslands, you're flipping bison patties to see what's under there and then you put it back. Um, <laughs> preferably you choose the dry ones. <laughs> um, bison, dung and, uh, <laughs> bison are generally more efficient ruminants than cattle, so their dung is drier than mm -hmm. cow patties. Mm -hmm. So there is less to be um, utilized from the dung. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like a cattle, pa uh, cattle patty will have more, more food for something else. I'm sorry. I only heard part of what you said about the uh, gophers, the prairie dogs. Mm -hmm. Do they still have a symbiotic relationship with them, even though the buffalo are contained in the way? They do. We have a small prairie dog colony of Gunnison prairie dogs. Um, they're out on the west side. Um, they're not so Gunnison, so they're five prairie dog um, species. Gunnisons are threatened. Um, they're, they're threatened species here in New Mexico, and I. I think they're threatened on the federal level as well. Um, they they hibernate in the winter, so we're we're on the lower range of their um, elevation range. Um, it's it's not a colony that has thrived, so to speak. It's always there. It's always kind of there, but it hasn't really boomed. A um, couple of different reasons. When they were translocated in the first place, was a bit of a problem because it was a bit too close to their hibernation to the choker. Um, so they didn't have a lot of time to kind of build their systems. Um, the year after that, they got hit by plague, so then that dampened down their numbers, and then the drought hasn't helped. Um, so we control for, for plague through dusting for uh, fleas. So we actually, um, we dust it um, in the spring, and then if it's, a, if it's a wet spring, we dust them again in the summer. And that's, that's been actually a pretty effective way of, of kind of keeping plague at, at, at bay. Um, but the drought hasn't helped, certainly, so uh, I don't know if we are keeping up or slightly below our original numbers, but it certainly isn't growing at the moment, and I, it probably won't grow for a while until any, something happens with the drought. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Very <laughs>